Okay, everybody wake up. <laughs> Here we go. I don't know how I got on this list, but it's, uh, it's going to be interesting today, folks. <laughs> um, my name is Joe Ingram. Uh, sometimes I'm John, sometimes I'm Phil. <clears throat> it's whoever's name tag I can find out there the quickest. Well, today <laughs> I found my own at home, so we're good. Uh, we have the pleasure today of uh, having a guest uh, minister with us, and his name is Rachel. Uh, Rachel Gilmore. She is an elder from the uh, Virginia Conference. She planted a church there in Virginia Beach for a decade before serving as a director of, boy, this print small, <laughs> training and assessing of church planters. I'm hoping that church, meaning you're starting a church, not planting something. Okay. For the United Methodist denomination at Discipleship Ministries. In 21, she relocated to Phoenix where she and her husband, Brandon, were appointed to the Central United Methodist Church. That's one on Central Avenue, just north of McDowell. As of July 1st, she's the Director of New and Vital Faith for the Desert Southwest Conference. She's written two books, uh, launched two podcasts, and co-founded a company to train church planters nationally. She enjoys living in Central Phoenix with her husband, children, and dogs. Okay, for in-person worshipers, if you did not attend, didn't sign the attendance, please do so. Uh, we welcome those that are worshiping online. Uh, you're reminded to register even if you are worshiping from home. Uh, online worshipers during the worship will offer instructions, if I can read these instructions, such as standing and sitting, that we invite you to follow or not, whatever's most comfortable for you. We also invite you to interact with us by sharing your comments in the chat. Pastor Jody, of course, is on vacation till the 25th. And how did you get out of that? I mean, uh, no rest for the wicked. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, Pastor Catherine Keller will be providing pastoral care during the week if somebody needs some uh, extra time. Uh, just contact the office if you would like her to contact you and arrange for a visit. So let's begin our worship with our invitation to worship. It's the song Holy in the Faith We Sing. The lyrics will be on the screen. Now, this is kind of a special song. We might not have sung it before. Uh, those of you who are musicians, if, if you want to grab one of those, like right there, those skinny little black books, they're available. Uh, because it goes by kind of fast, all right? It, it's, it's a Central American song, originally in Spanish, but we'll go ahead and do it in English today. Uh, once we get to know it a little better, I'd love to do maybe a little bit of Espanol. But um, this is... The Holy Holy, it's not the Sanctus from the Catholic Mass, even though it has lots of holies. It's, um, it, 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 you'll get the story. Yeah, so, <laughs> but the other thing I wanted to tell you is that it has a beat a little bit uh, difficult. It's a little bit like, I want to live in America. Everyone recognize that? West Side Story? Right, right. So this has, this isn't one of those one that's in a peppy uh, one, two, three, dot, 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 dot kind of thing. So it, it moves along. I'd like, I'm going to go ahead and sing the chorus with them once, just, or I'll sing it for you. Uh, if you know it, you're welcome to sing along. But it goes, the chorus goes like, Holy, 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 holy is our Lord. God is Lord of all creation. Holy, holy is our Lord. Holy, 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 holy is our Lord. God is Lord of past and future. Holy, holy is our Lord. See, it's not hard. Does that sound? That's not hard. No, no. Well, I, I, I think I should do one verse real quick because that's different. It's not the same way. All right. It goes like, in the middle of the village, beside us in our struggles, throughout the whole creation, God is the only one. Blessings in the one who teaches the good news of the gospel, the message of salvation, of peace and liberty. I'm popping my peas this morning. That's not a good thing. Sorry, people at home, if your uh, speakers are exploding. All right. So are we ready? Let's do it. All right. Um, yeah, standing is optional, but it, it can, it's known to help with... Uh, Breathing and flow, you know, so you stand as you are able. All right, are we ready? Let's do the intro. Ready? One, two. All right, here we go. Here we 
Here we go. Ready, everyone? Holy, 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 holy is our Lord. God is Lord of all creation. Holy, holy is our Lord. Holy, 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 holy is our Lord. God is Lord of past and future. Holy, holy is our Lord. Here we go. In the middle of the village, beside us in our struggles, throughout the whole creation, God is the only one. Blessings to the one who teaches the good news of the gospel, the message of salvation, of peace and liberty. Now we do the whole thing one more time, just like what you just did. Ready? And... Holy, 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 holy is our Lord. God is Lord of all creation. Holy, holy is our Lord. Holy, 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 holy is our Lord. God is Lord of past and future. Holy, holy is our Lord too. In the middle of the village we us in our struggles throughout the whole creation God is the only one blessings to the one who teaches the good news of the gospel the message of salvation of peace and liberty bueno <laughs> sit down please oh I took your I stepped on your line I bet I'm sorry, Joe. Okay. <clears throat> we invite you to stand as you're able and comfortable to say the oh. call. <laughs> what did I do that for? <laughs> yep. You're right. Okay. <laughs> and I blew it. I'm sorry. Call to worship. The words will be on the screen. Uh, it's not a musical. Oh, sorry. Be nice at the music. Christ is calling you as disciples. You will be led into fields of mission and service. Lord Jesus, where you lead us, we will go. Listen for Christ's call to you. We are ready to serve the Lord. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing together our hymn of praise. Here I am, Lord, number 593 in our hymnal. The lyrics will also be on the screen. I will go, Lord, 
of the day it'll be on the screen join me in praying aloud open unto me light for my darkness open unto me courage for my fear open unto me hope for my despair open unto me peace for my turmoil open unto me joy for my sorrow open unto me strength for my weakness Open unto me wisdom for my confusion. Open unto me forgiveness for my sins. Open unto me love for my hates. Open unto me thyself for myself. Lord, Lord, open unto me. And now we have the children's message. Rachel? Yes, okay. So... We might not have children physically here, but there might be some online. Um, and we're all children at heart, right? We're all children of God. So I am a guest preacher. I don't know any of you, and this is a big gamble. But I need two volunteers for the children's sermon. Anyone crazy enough? Uh, it's really simple, I promise. I'm going to teach you discipleship in, like, five easy steps. Okay? I'm, yay! Thank you. Come on up. And Joe. Okay. So, ready? You're going to be the future disciple. So, you stay right there. I'll start with Anita. Okay. So, kids, sometimes when we hear that we're supposed to go and make disciples of all nations, we're not sure how to do that, right? How do I teach someone to pray or to read the Bible or to um, play the piano? I would need lots of help and discipleship for that, Anita. Um, so, okay. So, there are these two church planters, I call them the Ferguson brothers in Chicago, and they came up with the easiest way, so all of us can make disciples after this, okay? So it's like five easy steps. So step one is I'm going to do something and you're going to watch, okay? So I'm going to, I'm going to clap and you watch and then we talk. Do you have questions about that? About clapping? No, pretty easy. Okay, so then I'm going to do it and you're going to help me. So let's clap together. Awesome. And then we talk. That was good. Was it good for you? I like clapping. It was great. Okay, and then you do it, and I'm going to help you. So ready? You start clapping, and I'll clap along. Yay! Okay, and then you're going to do it, and I'm going to just watch you. Perfect. And then you're going to do it, and he's going to watch you, and I get to go. And I've made my disciple of clapping. And now Joe gets, yay! So that's how I, I, we're all going to clap now. Yeah, so Anita, you fully went through the whole discipleship process. So I do, you watch, we talk. I do, you help, we talk. Um, you do, I help, we talk. You do, I watch, we talk. You do, someone else watches. That's it. Okay, so kids, try that at home with something really fun and know that you can make disciples wherever you go. That's right, easy. That's our challenge. That's a sermon. I'm done. Just everybody go. <laughs> Beat the Baptist to lunch. No, I'm just kidding. You can't go anywhere. Thank you, Rachel. Yes. 
That was interesting. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Matthew. As Jesus instructs the disciples to go forth and make more disciples, listen to what the Spirit is saying in Matthew 28, 16 through 20, as found in the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of age. For the word of God, for the word of God among us, and the word of God within us, we say, thanks be to God. How do I know? A lot of people, when they think of the phrase, how do I know, they always want to put the what behind it. How do I know what I'm supposed to do? The, the question that you really should ask is, how do I know why I'm here? Because when you know your why, your what becomes more clear and more impactful. If you know, like for instance, um, people know that I do comedy, but that's what I do. My why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. So I can do comedy, I can write books, I can be in a movie because all of it is motivated by my why. In fact, I have a new, uh, a new web series out called Michael Jr. Break Time. Uh, we probably just did the sixth episode. It's on YouTube. So every single Wednesday at 3 o'clock, we drop a new episode on YouTube of Michael Jr. Break Time. What it is is it's me. I travel around the country, and I do stand-up comedy, in case you didn't know. And in the middle of my comedy set sometime, I'll stop and just talk to my audience. And we've been filming this, and it's, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. So I'm, we're in Winston-Salem. I'm going to show you a clip from Winston-Salem. And I'm just talking to this guy in the audience, and he tells me that he's a, uh, a musical instructor at a school. So I was like, all right, you're a musical instructor. You know, can you sing? Let me hear you sing a song. So this is what happened at the last episode of Michael Jr.'s Break Time. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right. So um, let me get a couple. Let me get a couple bars of like uh, "Amazing Grace." Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That bro could sing, you know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Um, now, what you give me the version is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Here's what I want you to catch. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what becomes more impactful because you're walking towards or in your purpose. Isn't that the best video ever? It's my absolute favorite because um, I'm reminded that 
we're all in church, right? And we all have sung Amazing Grace. We could sing it right now. But I think most of us would sing that first version because for so many of us, all across the U.S. and the world, we've forgotten why we sing. We've forgotten why we're truly here, what it's all about. Um, so that's why I'm so excited that Jody invited me to come and preach with you today because as the director of New and Vital Faith for this annual conference, my job is to help us get back to that why, why we're here, why we're singing. So, um, so part of my job is to help start new faith communities, and a lot of times folks are like, well, why do we need new churches? We have plenty of churches. But what I love about Arizona is we all realize there are more people coming and our churches can't keep up, okay? So I did some, I'm a big nerd, so I did some data analysis on um, those that live within a two and a half mile radius of this building and how it's grown over the years, okay? Ready, get this. Um, according to the census data, in two, from the year 2000 to 2010, the population within two and a half miles of this building increased 934% from 3,000 to 33,000. And from 2010 to 2022, it increased another 67% to fit over 55,000 people live within two miles. I mean, I live in central Phoenix and this is my first time in Queen Creek and I'm like, Look at all of the neighborhoods, like everywhere. They go on and on and on. With all of these people here, it makes sense to start new churches, right? Like Song of Life, new churches for all the new people living here. And the other reason that we start new churches is because people who have never been to church in their life, and we're seeing more and more of these post-Christian people that were never raised in church, it's easier for them to go to a brand new faith community than one that's been around, like Central, uh, my husband's church, for 150 years. Um, and you might ask, well, why? Why is it so much easier to go to a new church? And it's because a lot of our new churches and faith communities help people understand the basics of faith. So when I planted a church um, right out of seminary in 2009, I had a six-month-old son, my husband was at another church in town, and um, I'll never forget my first Bible study that I led, right? Because I, they just said, go. Well, there were 10 young adults in Virginia Beach. And I was like, Jesus got 12 disciples, and I get 10 people to start a whole church. But we had a Bible study that grew into four Bible studies. And so one night, I was leading a group for these people. And at the end, this young girl in her 20s came up and said, okay, Pastor Rachel, I have a question. And I'm like, hit me with it. And she said, I like opened my Bible the way you told me to and I read through like those first few books of that New Testament thing. And okay, so I know Jesus died and rose again. I get that. But why does Jesus die four times? And I'm like, what? And she said, well, he died in Matthew and then in Mark and then in Luke and then in John. And I'm like, oh, that is the best to this day, the best question I think I've ever heard because she had how do you know what you don't know? And in her mind, she's starting at the beginning and then Jesus just keeps dying over and over again. And so I was able to explain that to her and, and then later baptize her and now she's active at a Methodist church in Florida with her husband and three boys who have grown up in the church. But as a pastor who has like always been at like, not only have I always been in the church because my dad was a Navy chaplain and a Methodist pastor, my mom was ordained in a Baptist church, so we might get lively up in here. But, um, but there has been a Methodist pastor actively preaching in my family since 1912, every single consecutive year. So the questions that I got as a church planter, like what is manna? Or you say, turn to 1 Corinthians 13. What is that? I have no idea what those numbers mean. I don't know what chapters and verses are. Like, to try to explain that to people was so awesome because that's what we're here for, right, is to help introduce faith to people that never knew God's love could extend to them. Um, so the two reasons to start a church are because people are coming and they need a place to go um, or people who never thought they would come to church have now found a home. So uh, the reality with COVID is that nationally for Methodist churches, and I don't know what the data is like for you guys here at Song of Life, but um, what we're seeing is that 
post-COVID, only about 50 to 60% of your average worship attendance has come back now that we've reopened our doors. So that's kind of the standard. So if that's what you're experiencing, you're in great company. That's where we're at. Um, in addition to that, if you're trying to reach people, this is why I love the technology and high people at home, uh, Barna did some research that found that 60% of folks under 45, so millennials, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, 60% have said they will never ever go back to weekly in-person worship again. So if we're not doing anything online, we're saying goodbye to 60% of the future young adults for the church. So, um, so that can lead a lot of us in the church to say, well, people just don't care anymore. They don't love Jesus anymore. They're not taking their faith seriously. Like, why don't they care about God? But here's what's interesting. Um, Google, we all like Google stuff, right, on the internet. Google reported that in February of 2020, when all the shutdown stuff was happening, February and March, that the word prayer was th the most searched as it ever has been in all of history. So people are searching on Google to figure out what prayer is, 50% higher than the, than the year before. Um, and at the same time, the one, some of the top 10 searches were how do I heal? How do I forgive? How do I find purpose? So people are seeking to understand faith in God, but they don't think they can find it in a church. Like, why is that? Um, and when I was trying to think about why people are searching for God but don't know that they could search for God amongst Christians or in churches, I was led to the three parables in Luke 15. And I'll get to the, the Great Commission verse too. Um, but in Luke 15, it starts with three stories of people or things that are lost, right? So we start off where there's a shepherd and he loses one out of 100 sheep, right? So he leaves the 99. How many of you like grew up in the church? Do we all remember this lost sheep story, right? So he goes on out, he finds that lost sheep, he comes back and he throws a party because that one sheep has been found. So he lost 1% of the flock and, and found him and celebrated. After that, we read a story about a woman who loses one of 10 coins. So a 10% loss, right? And she searches everywhere, she cleans the house, she finds that coin and invites her friends over to party, party, party. Um, and then we move to a loss of 50%. So from 1% to 10%, you see it's growing more important. And it's the parable of the lost son, the prodigal son, where a father has two sons. One son says, give me my inheritance now. I'm going to Vegas. I'm going to gamble. I'm going to find some loose women and drink too much and live up my life. Um, and he realizes that was not a good choice and fulfilling. And so he comes back home. And his dad gives him a great outfit and throws a big, big party for him. And so if you've grown up in the church your whole life, like I have, we always hear like, hooray, the lost son comes home. Every single person is found. I hate to break it to you, but um, in Jewish tradition, when they write stories like this, it builds and the ending is the most important. And so in the story of the prodigal or lost son, at the end of that story, one son is still lost. He's not found. And it's the son that never left home, the son that always stayed there. Um, and that son is angry, and he's bitter, and he's frustrated, and he's jealous because he did the work. He made the right choices. He grew up in church. He's been a pastor in a line of 112 years of consecutive pastors. He's led trustees. He's led the Sunday school, or she's led the vacation Bible school. She's sang in the choir. I've been here my whole life, and you're telling me someone's going to walk through those doors and take my spot and take my pew? I don't think so. And so at the end of that story, that lost son is so angry. He turns to his father, and he doesn't say, oh, my brother is a hot mess. He says, your son, this son of yours wasted your money. How dare you welcome him home? And people outside of the church don't think they can find answers to God inside of the church because, okay, it's a truth moment. I get to preach and run away. You can yell at Jody about this later. It's because a lot of our churches are, are full of these older sons who don't want to celebrate and rejoice. Um, we've done the work and we want the credit and we want to keep the doors of our church open for us. I mean, that's a harsh truth and reality, but I'm going to name it because we're all here to work through this together. Um, 
So what do we do if new faith is about celebrating and parties and not all of us are hardwired to party? Uh, what might be the answer to revitalize uh, churches, revitalize faith communities? And that's where we get to the Great Commission, where God, uh, Jesus, before he ascends into heaven, tells his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. And when I heard that as a kid, I was like, oh my goodness, I just imagine like Jesus in this powerful place and sending us out like to Timbuktu or where, you know, sending me from Virginia Beach to Phoenix, make disciples. Um, but again, being a nerd, I love languages. And if you read that passage in Koine Greek, the original language that we have, have it in, the word go is not a command. It's not in the imperative. So Jesus isn't saying, go, get out there, Rachel. Go do that one thing that one time. Go and make that disciple. Another translation of the Great Commission is, as you are going, make disciples. So it's not a one and done kind of thing. It's as you are going, as you go to the grocery store, to the golf course, to the library, to family dinner, to your neighborhood association, to the pool, to the mall, as you are going, wherever you go make disciples it's a way of life everywhere you go there's an opportunity to see someone and love them with god's love that leads to a great party and celebration um, and i love i love that interpretation as a pastor because it means it's not my job to do all the new and vital faith it's not my job to revitalize it's our job as we are all going wherever it is that we go we make disciples and I don't know if you realize how important laity, non-pastors are to the Methodist Church, um, but over the 4th of July, I took a vacation with my family to New York City, and we went to John Street Methodist Church. Has anyone ever been to New York, to the financial district, Manhattan, right? Okay, anyone a fan of like Hamilton, that Broadway? The, you know the Room Where It Happened song? Okay, so the Room Where It Happened is literally right behind John Street, where in 1790, Hamilton met with Thomas Jefferson and James Madison to figure out the capital would be in D.C. so he could have his financial plan. Anyways, this is not about Hamilton, but my kids love seeing that spot. But John Street um, is, I, well, there are two places vying to say that they were the very first Methodist society um, on U.S. soil. But John Street is one of them. And in 1760, there was a woman, hey, all for the ladies in the house, this is our story. There was a woman named Barbara from Germany, immigrated to Ireland, and then from Ireland to the US with her husband. And they were active in the Methodist Church in Ireland. And so when they got to the US in 1760, she walked in one night on her brother and this guy named Philip Embury, who was another trained Methodist pastor, but he was a school teacher. So he wasn't like a pastor, pastor. He wasn't official. He didn't study for it. He wasn't an Anglican priest. But she walks in and she sees all these boys playing cards and gambling, and she loses her mind. She flips over that table. She throws the cards in the fire, and she turns to Philip, and she said, you open your Bible or there will be blood on my hands. So Philip listened to Barbara, and he started a, the very first Methodist society in the U.S. And... Um, it grew so large, it became John Street Methodist Church, and there was another guy, a British soldier named Captain Webb. You have to Google pictures of these people. They are so awesome. Captain Webb would preach with, in his full British uniform with a, with a sword on his pulpit. As a pastor, that would make me feel kind of tough, like, go ahead and like argue with my interpretation. I'm, I'm ready. Um, so, And Captain Webb, being trained and nurtured in the faith there at John Street, would go on to start the very first Methodist societies in New Jersey, Philadelphia, Delaware, and Baltimore before a little thing called the Revolution happened, and they needed him back home in Britain, so then he went back home. Um, but it's amazing. And so if it hadn't been for Barbara and Philip and Captain Webb, there would be no Methodist church in the New York area or even out to Arizona. And then the other pl people that are um, vying to say they were the first, we do know this couple was the very first in recorded history to tell someone about Jesus and convert them into the Methodist church. And it's a couple in, in Maryland uh, called Robert and Elizabeth Strawbridge. He was a farmer. So again, not trained pastors, right? It's not the pastor's job to make disciples. Well, it is the pastor's job, but it's all of our jobs 
So Robert was out farming, and Elizabeth was cooking dinner and telling someone about Jesus as they all got ready to sit and have dinner together. And that man accepted Christ and was baptized. First baptism happened because a woman cooking dinner shared her faith with someone at the table. Um, so it's part of our DNA. It's who we are as Methodists to go. And as we go, love people. Have, so, so the reason that we're going and making disciples isn't so we have more pledge cards or a higher average worship attendance, right? Because if we read John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world, not for God so loved the church, that he gave the world to the church to fill its pews. For God so loved the world that he gave the world us to go out and to love and serve. And um, as the director of New and Vital Faith, it might sound like a horrible idea for me to tell you to go and start Bible studies or prayer groups at you know tattoo parlors or coffee shops or dog parks or libraries or wherever. Um, but it means people are learning to follow Jesus. And that's what it's all about. That's our why. That's what makes us sing Amazing Grace like we've never sung it before. Um, and I was challenged just last week to live this out uh, in my own life. Uh, okay, so Central United Methodist Church is right there on North Central Avenue, right across the street from the Attorney General and from ICE. And so we got a call a couple months ago from um, ICE and Border Patrol, and they said, listen, we have lots of families crossing the border, and we don't have any place to house families. And so... Uh, we don't want to leave them on the street in the summer in Phoenix. Could we drop a bus or two off every week for you guys to take care of? And we were like, um, we have about as many people in our church as are in this room right now. And we're like, okay, Lord, um, why not? Uh, let, uh, let's, let's do this. And FEMA stepped in with some help and cots and everything else. So anyways, our first busload came on Monday with 48 people from... Cuba, Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, Bangladesh, and Brazil. So those were our six countries represented. And I had the honor that morning of calling their sponsors and saying, your family members are safe. They're on their way to Phoenix, and they want to connect with you. So buy them tickets. We're at one man was in Vegas, and he's like, I'm getting dressed right now, and I'm on my way. And another man was in New York, and he said, I'm getting my sister and my niece a ticket on a 3 p.m. flight today. So as the bus pulled up and all of these families, young children, got off, we were able to give them food and some air conditioning. And um, I, will, I, I don't think I'll ever forget the woman from Brazil when she and her five-year-old daughter sat down to eat. She started panicking, and she said, I'm here but I have no money to get to New York to my brother. I don't know how to get there, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And when I was able to tell her, your brother knows you're here, and you have a 3 o'clock flight to go home to him, she collapsed, sobbing in my arms as she held her little girl and knew that her journey would end with the celebration and being reunited um, with her brother. And, you know, all of these families, uh, they had all their documents, they had their court dates, they had all their tracking systems from Border Patrol, um, and when that man from Vegas showed up at our church fellowship hall and his three-year-old grandson saw him, the three-year-old cried out, Poppy, and he ran and jumped in, in his grandpa's arms. And seeing these families come back together again and find hope and love and feel seen um, changed me forever. And, and hearing how grateful these families were for a bowl of soup and a little stuffed animal and a shower before they continued their journey will stay with me. And so will all these people, are they at Central this morning for worship? No. They're at home celebrating with family and friends, but part of their story will always be, I was lost, I was alone, I was a stranger, you welcomed me, I was hungry and you fed me. Um, and that's what it's about, is loving people who feel forgotten or unseen. And if there are 55,000 people within two miles of this building, I can guarantee there are people who need to feel God's love who need to know they're not alone and that they're understood and that someone cares. And so um, my hope and prayer for all of us is that as we are going, wherever we go, that we take God's love with us and we live out that great commission um, and welcome more people into faith with Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. We are now moving into our time of prayer.
Right, Joe? You want me to? Yes! Woohoo! Um, so I will lead us in a prayer together, um, and then we will conclude by praying the Lord's Prayer together that will be up on the screen, okay? So um, I'm going to do something I didn't do last service, David, Anita. Are you ready? I'm going to uh, introduce a form of prayer to you called Centering Down from the Quaker tradition. Are we ready to be like Quakers? This will be fun. Okay, so what you need to do is um, close your eyes, and we want good posture. So with your eyes closed, you try to um, sit up as straight as possible, uncross your legs, and rest your hands on your lap. Okay? And all you have to do for the first few moments is just breathe. God, we give you thanks for the gift of this day for a chance to center ourselves, silence ourselves in your presence, in your power, uh, in your hope and forgiveness. And so for a moment, Lord, we just want to rest and feel your love fall upon us. God, while we're grateful for your love, we also Realize that there are things that distract us, things that we're worried about, people or situations that we're thinking about right now. So we're going to turn our hands from resting on our lap to facing up towards the ceiling. And so God, as our hands are facing up towards the heavens, we're mindful of all the things we're holding on to, of concerns about our health or the health of loved ones or of upcoming plans or work stress or Whatever it might be, Lord, these are things and situations, uh, people that we just can't control. We can't fix it. Uh, it's broken or it's a mess and we're exhausted and don't know what to do. So we're going to lift these things up to you, God. And with our hands open, we'll lift them up to the heavens and then turn our hands to rest on our lap again. And when we do that, God, it's a symbol that we're letting go. We're not holding on anymore. We're letting you take those things away from us because you're God and you can do way more than we can do. So be with those people, those places, those things as we let go of control and let you be God. Pour out your wisdom, your strength, your grace, your peace, your comfort, your power in those ways so that hope and help can come where it is most needed. And Lord, now we're acutely aware that we aren't holding on to anything anymore. So we're going to turn our hands back um, to the ceiling, facing up towards the heavens. And this time, Lord, our hands are empty because you've taken away those burdens, those concerns. And with empty hands, we can receive all that you long to give us, your love, your peace, your grace your will, um, the why, that purpose in our lives. Give us a new version of amazing grace to sing so the world will know you are real in us. We will rest for a moment and receive your love. God, we are grateful for the new ways you are at work in us and around us. And we pray that you would continue to challenge us to get outside of our comfort zone, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We're also thankful for our old things, for traditions that ground us and provide a foundation. And so we cry out to you now using the words that your son taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, as United Methodists, we are called to use our whole being in making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We're also called to invest our energies into making God's grace a tangible reality for all. 
that's done by using our time, our talent, and our treasure. Our tithes and gifts and offering are used here in our community, throughout our conference, and all over the world for those who are in need of experience, grace for today, and hope for tomorrow. We invite you to give your financial gifts either online or through the links on our website by using our Church Center app or place them in the giving box in the back as you leave worship this morning. Let us now take a moment to offer our prayer of thanksgiving for the givers, the gifts, and those who will benefit from our generosity. And my offering prayer is as follows. Your word says that the earth is yours and everything in it. We recognize everything we have belongs to you. We now offer back to you a portion of what you have given us. Help us to bring these offerings with an eager heart. Bless us and keep us. Make your face to shine upon us. Give us peace in these trying times. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Him a celebrate him a celebration Yay. number 584 oh. Lord you give the great commission we can play who's on first you know that sort of thing all right wait a minute I'm getting oh okay. shall we have you stand as you are able and willing and we'll wait until you're ready there's five verses so you get a little bit of a workout on this one here we go one two three Lord you give the great commission Heal the sick and preach the word. Lest the church neglect its mission and the gospel go. Lord, you. 
Would you show us love's true measure? Father, what they do forgive. Yet we hoard as private treasure all that you so free. to a just society with the Spirit's gifts empower us for the work of ministry. Lord, you bless with words of Assuring, I am with you to the end. Faith and hope and love restoring, may we serve as you intend. And amid the Spirit's gifts empower us for the work of ministry. Receive now the benediction. We all talk about church decline, but the Methodist church started to decline in the 1800s when we stopped sending out laity and started building first UMCs so pastors didn't have to travel so much. So um, lighten our load. Go and make disciples as you are going wherever you go. And know that you will not be alone, not even for a moment of this journey. As you go with all the grace, peace, and power of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.